Great, so I will begin with phase shifts and do the introduction of how to make sure we can really, uh, so this is the important part of this. Um, just like when we added the reflected and transmitted wave, we could find a solution. I'm going to try to explain why with these things we can find solutions in general. Uh, so this is uh, a subject of partial waves, and um, it's, it's a nice subject, a little technical. There might seem to be a lots of formulas here, but uh, the ideas are relatively simple. Once one keeps in mind the one-dimensional analogies, the one-dimensional analogies are very valuable here, and we will emphasize them a lot. So uh, we will discuss partial waves and phase shifts. OK. So it's time to simplify these matters a little bit. Um, and to do that, I will assume from now on that the potential is central. So V of R is equal to V of R. That will simplify the azimuthal dependence. There will be no azimuthal dependence. Just, you, have, you see, the thing is spherically symmetric, but still you're coming from a particular direction, the z. So you can expect now that the scatter wave depends on the angle of the particle with respect to z, because it's spherically symmetric. But it shouldn't depend on phi, the angle phi should just depend on theta. So expect f of theta on. Now, a free particle is something we all know how to solve, e to the i k x. Why do we bother with a free particle in so many ways? Uh, because a uh, free particle is very important. Part of the solution is free particles. To some degree, far away, it is free particles as well. And we need to understand free particles in spherical coordinates. So it's something we've done in 805 and uh, sometimes in 804. And we look at the radial equation, which is associated to spherical coordinates, for a free particle. So we'll consider free particle. And we'd say, well, that's very simple. But it's not all that simple in spherical coordinates. And you'd say, OK, if it's not simple in spherical coordinates, why do we bother? We bother because scattering is happening in spherical coordinates. So we can't escape having to do the free particle in spherical coordinates. It's something you have to do. So what are solutions in spherical coordinates? We have solution psi of r. Remember, the language of spherical coordinates was a u of r divided by r and a ylm of omega. That was a typical solution, a single solution of the Schrodinger equation. We'll the u only depends on l. The m disappears. So this is r. These r's are r's without a vector, because you're already talking about the radial equation. So um, and depend on the energy and depend on the value of the l quantum number. So what is the Schrodinger equation? The radial equation is minus h squared over 2m the second the r squared plus h squared over 2m 
L times L plus 1 over R squared. Remember the potential centrifugal barrier in defective potential. Then you would have V of R here, but it's free particle. So V of R is equal to 0. So nothing else. U of E L of little r is equal to the energy, which is h squared k squared over 2m u e l. And that's a parameterization of the energy in terms of a k squared like that. Well, lots of h squared, k squared, uh, and two m's, uh, so we can get rid of them. Uh, cancel the h squared over two m. You get minus d second, d r squared plus l times l plus one over r u e l is equal to k squared u e l. It's a nice equation. It's the equation of the free particle in spherical coordinates. Now, this is like a Schrodinger equation. And I think uh, when you look at that, you could get puzzled whether or not the value of k squared or the energy might end up being quantized. Um, because Schrodinger equation many times quantizes the energy. But here it shouldn't happen. This is a free particle. All values of k should be allowed. So there should be no quantization. Um, this is an r squared here. And the reason you can see, one reason, at least analytically, that there's no quantization is that uh, you can define a new variable, rho equal kr. And then this whole differential equation becomes minus d second d rho squared plus l times l plus 1 over rho squared. Um, well, I can put the other number in there as well, or should I not? No, it's not done here. Uh, U E L is equal to U E L. And the K squared disappeared completely. That tells you that the K squared cannot get quantized. If there's a solution of this differential equation, it holds for all values of K. And these are going to be like plane waves. And maybe that's another reason you can think that k doesn't get quantized, because these solutions are not normalizable anyway. So uh, it shouldn't get quantized. So with this equation in here, we get the two main solutions. Uh, the solutions of this differential equation are um, Bessel functions, spherical Bessel functions. UEL is equal to a constant AL times rho times the Bessel function lowercase j of rho. There's a rho times that function. That's the way. Uh, it uh, shows up. It's kind of interesting. It's because, in fact, you have to divide u by r. So that would mean dividing u by rho. And it means that the radial function is just the Bessel function without anything else. And then there's the other Bessel function, the n sub l, a rho, times an n sub l of rho. So those are spherical Bessel functions. As you're familiar from the notation, the j is the one that is healthy at rho equals 0, doesn't diverge. The n is the solution that diverges at the origin. And both of them behave nicely far away. 
So um, JL of x goes like 1 over x sine of x minus L pi over 2. And eta L of x behaves like minus 1 over x cosine of x minus L pi over 2. This is for x big, x much greater than 1. You have this behavior. So these are our solutions. And here is the thing that we have to do. We have to rewrite our solutions in terms of spherical waves, because this was a spherical wave. So we should even write this part as a spherical wave. And this is a very interesting and, in some ways, strange representation of e to the i kz. Um, you have e to the i kz that you have an intuition for it as a plane wave in the z direction represented as an infinite sum of incoming and outgoing spherical waves. That's what's going to happen. So if we have, um, so this is last thing I'm going to do here. We have that e to the i k z is a plane wave solution. So it's a solution of a free particle. So I should be able to write the superpositions of these solutions that we have found. So um, it should be a superposition of solutions of this type. So it could be a sum of coefficients a l times, uh, well, a l m, you think, uh, some a's times um, um, solutions. Remember, we're writing a full solution. So a full solution, you divide by r. So you divide by these quantities. So you could have an a. L M uh, J L of rho plus B L M eta L of rho times Y L M. So this should be a general solution, and that would be a sum over L's and M's of all those quantities. But that's a lot more than what you need. First, this does not diverge near r equals 0. It has no divergence anywhere. And the eta, or the n's, I think they're n's, actually, not eta's. The n's diverge for rho equal to 0. So none of these are necessary. So I, I can erase those. L and M. But there is more. This function is invariant under azimuthal rotations. If you have your axis here, here's the Z, and you have a point here, and you rotate it, the value of Z doesn't change. It's independent of phi for a given theta. Z just depends on R of cosine theta. So there's no phi dependence. But all the YLMs with M different from 0 have phi dependence. So M cannot be here either. M must be 0. So you must be down to sum over L, AL, some coefficient, JL of rho, YL0. And uh, all of those would be perfectly good plane wave solutions. 
Whatever numbers you choose for the little ALs, those are good solutions because we've built them by taking linear combinations of exact solutions of this equation. But to represent this quantity, the ALs must take particular values. Uh, so what is that formula? That formula is quite famous, and uh, perhaps even you could discuss um, this in recitation. e to the i k z, which is e to the i k r cosine theta, is the sum 4 pi. Now you have to get all the constants right. Square root of 4 pi, sum from L equals 0 to infinity. Square root of 2L plus 1. <laughs> Coefficients are pretty funny. They get worse <laughs> very fast. Now you have if I to the L, I to the L, Y L 0 of theta, doesn't depend on phi, JL of KR. This is the expansion that we need. There's no way we can make progress with this problem unless we have this expansion. But now, why the intuition that I was telling you of these waves coming in and out well, uh, you have e to the i k z, you sum an infinite sum over partial waves. A partial wave is a different value of L. These are partial waves. As I was saying, any solution is a sum of partial waves. It's a sum over L. And where are the waves? Well, the j L of k r is a far away, it's a sign. And a sine of x is an exponential ix minus e to the minus ix over 2. So here you have exponentials of e to the ikr and exponentials of e to the minus ikr, which are waves that are here, like outgoing waves and incoming waves. So the e to the ikz is a sum of ingoing and outgoing spherical waves. And that's an intuition that we will exploit very clearly to solve this problem. So we will do that uh, next.